Many people don't really understand the rules of investment. People don't understand rates of return. People also don't understand the risks and rewards of certain types of investments. The most important investment they're going to make is in their house. I think people in their 20s probably shouldn't be worried about their retirement that much. I went to large public high school. There was never any discussion of financial literacy then. Well, if somebody wants to be a professional investor or really wants to take bigger risks, obviously there are things you can do. What are the biggest mistakes people make when it comes to buying their house? The biggest mistakes people make, I think, are... Welcome to the Erica Taught Me podcast, the number one business podcast in the U.S., where we talk about entrepreneurship, money, and how to improve your life and achieve success. I'm your host, Erica Kohlberg. I'm a lawyer and personal finance expert with over 18 million followers on social media. Today, I'm interviewing David Rubenstein, a self-made billionaire and investor. He co-founded one of the largest and most successful private investment companies, the Carlyle Group. They manage over $373 billion in assets. So of course, I'm going to ask him about where he thinks we should invest our money. David also interviewed over 20 of the most successful investors of all time, like Ray Dalio, for his latest book. And he gives us the 10 traits they all have in common. We also dive into David's personal story about how he went from working a nine to five as a lawyer to becoming a self-made billionaire and the biggest takeaways he has for us. So if you're excited to learn more about investing, how to think about diversifying your portfolio, and what you should care the most about in your early years of investing, let's jump in. I'm Erica Kohlberg, this is Erica Taught Me, and today we're here with David Rubenstein. So we both started off as lawyers. I still practice law, and I know you stopped practicing law in about 1986, 1987. What was the pivotal moment for you when you decided that you didn't want to be a lawyer anymore? I think if you're going to be really successful at something, you have to enjoy it. And I didn't enjoy the practice of law. Uh, I didn't think I was that good at it. And my clients didn't think I was that good at it. And so I decided to try to do something else. I had only practiced law two years in New York before I went to work in the White House. After the White House, I didn't have any other uh, skill set, so I practiced law, but I, I just didn't enjoy it. And nobody's ever won a Nobel Prize hating what you do. If you're going to be great at something, you have to love it. And I didn't love the practice of law, and it didn't love me. So then you went off to start Carlisle right away? I started Carlisle in 1987. I didn't have any background in finance. I didn't have any money, and I didn't have any contacts that would help me raise money. But I just decided I would do something different. So it was a bit of a gamble. Uh, most entrepreneurs who take gambles are, you know, are often in the same situation. They don't know if it's going to work or not. And 99.9% .9 of all the companies that get started don't work. So those, those people you've read about starting successful companies, they're a very small minority. In, in my case, I recruited some people that actually had finance experience. And then a friend of mine helped me raise the initial $5 million to get it off the ground. So from that first $5 million, we now manage about $400 billion almost. So it's grown a lot. But obviously, it was a lot of ups and downs along the way. So when you first started with the $5 million investment initially, when did you start to see success? When did you feel like it was going to work out? Well, let me explain. Uh, the private equity world in 1987 was a mom and pop business. Uh, all the private equity firms that were well known then, Forsman Little or KKR, they were small firms. When KKR did the famous RJR deal in 1989, it only had seven investment professionals. Uh, so the deal was big, but the firms were small. I came up with an idea that doesn't seem like it deserves a Nobel Prize, but it was a novel at the time, which is that we would do a buyout fund, and then after we raised our buyout fund, we would go raise other funds in other disciplines, growth capital, venture capital, real estate, and so forth. So we'd be a multi-disciplined organization, therefore giving us more ballast. So that's what Fidelity did. That's what T. Rowe Price did with Vanguard. Have many different funds. Take advantage of your brand name. And then I decided, secondly, to globalize it. Uh, historically, if you were an American buyout firm, you didn't invest in Europe or in Asia. I decided to have dedicated teams in Europe, Asia, Latin America, Japan, and so forth. And so that gave us an international presence, plus the ballast we had in the U.S. So that enabled us to grow and give us, you know, I would say a lot of heft in, in the private equity world. What was driving you all of this time? I know to leave the practice of law, you were driven because you did right. not enjoy it. What drove you after you left? Well, I have nothing against them, but I've never been uh, to a psychiatrist, so I can't say what my motive was. But I would say that I, I'm an only child. I guess only children do tend to be uh, fairly driven. Um, I'm always trying to prove that you know I'm better than I really am. And so I wanted to make sure that what I had built was going to survive, and I wanted to build something that would be notable. 
uh, not so much to make a lot of money because my real goal was to give away the money and I was an original signer of the Giving Pledge and I am in the process of giving away the bulk of my money now. And for those who don't know what the Giving Pledge is, can you just explain that? The Giving Pledge was conceived by Warren Buffett um, and uh, Bill Gates and Melinda Gates and was designed to say to people that have a net worth of more or less a billion dollars that they would commit to give away half or more during their lifetime or upon their death. There were 40 of us who signed initially now we probably have about 230 or so. And it's basically designed to promote the idea that giving away money is actually a good thing. And if actually, if you can give it away during your lifetime, it's probably even better because you can you know, meld what you wanted to do and mold it a bunch better than, than if you were waiting till you die. So I've been doing that and I'm involved in a lot of philanthropic organizations. One of the things I loved when I was reading about you is that you come from quite humble beginnings. It's not like your parents were extremely wealthy. I believe your dad was a postman. He, right. My father worked in the post office. Um, he dropped out of high school to go into World War II. When he came back, he met my to-be mother. Uh, they got married. They, he was 20. She was 17. Uh, I was their only child. He had not enough education to get a job that was better than working in the postal service. He was a file clerk for the entire career. And so that probably gave me some motivation. You know, it, it's very the most difficult thing in the world, actually, to probably do is be a successful parent to raise children uh, who do something that, that, that you might say is good. But it's even more difficult to do that when you have a lot of money. Now, I have a fair amount of money, so I have three children, and raising them um, is more challenging if you have a lot of money. My children are all in private equity, so maybe they're doing something useful. You never know. I always call it the highest calling of mankind. But um, when I was growing up, I didn't have any money, and I didn't know at the time how much of a benefit it was not to have money. Because when you don't have money, you have to work harder, you have to do things for yourself. And so in hindsight, I probably wasn't disadvantaged, I was advantaged because I didn't have money to fall back on or father that was famous or able to, to help me and open doors. And I remember hearing that your mother, you found newspaper clippings that she had saved of you. Yes. When my mother passed away a few years ago, I went through all of her clippings. And interestingly, the only clippings she really saved were clippings of my philanthropic gifts. All the business successes of Carlisle, she didn't really care those, to keep those clippings. And I think what she really was saying, in effect, was, I'm really proud of you for giving away your money. And in fact, when I started giving away a fair amount of money, she said, I'm really glad you're doing something useful with your money. Now, I could have given my money to my mother, a lot of money to my mother. She didn't want money. She just didn't really want a lot of money. So I gave her a reasonable amount for her lifestyle. But um, she... she um, was very philanthropic herself, but not with a lot of money. So when she passed away, I started getting her mail. And every day I get 20 or 30 um, letters from people that she'd given money to. Every organization you've ever heard of that sends out direct mailing was on, you know, she must have said yes to $5, <laughs> $10, $15. So now they're sending me the letters and I'm trying to deal with it. Do you feel like you made your mom proud? I would say, she, you know, she probably was proud. I mean, look, she was, you only had one child. And if your one child uh, gets to be, um, you know, well known for philanthropy or business, or like when I was younger, I worked in the White House as a young man. And, you know, working in the White House when you're, in, in, you know, young and um, probably something she was proud of as well. But, um, you know, I guess she probably was. But in the end, uh, you know, that, that was a motivation for me. Probably making your parents proud is probably a motivation. You might have it as well. So uh, I think everybody wants to make their parents think that they did something useful with their life and their parents were justified in bringing them into the, into the world. That's my biggest motivation. And I, I think also just seeing how much my parents have sacrificed to help me get to where I am, I just feel even more driven to be able to, while they're still healthy, be able to give them all of the things that I think they sacrificed and never had because of me. Yeah, parents who are uh, putting their energy into one child, I'm an only child, and you know that they kind of rely a lot on the, what the only child is going to do, and the only child turns out to be successful. That, that can be something that makes them proud, particularly if you're Jewish. My mother was a Jewish mother, and she's, you know, I often say the strongest magnetic force in the world is that between a mother, a Jewish mother and her, her only son. So, you know, I, I was close to my mother, but uh, in the end, uh, you know, I think the things she was most proud of are things like my giving away money. But when Carlisle bought Dunkin' Donuts, where she used to go when she was living in Florida uh, every day to get her coffee and her donuts, uh, I said, here's some free, you know, cards you can use and get free coffee or something. 
Well, she would go in there and say, you know what, my son owns Dunkin' Donuts. Well, they would go to roll their eyes and say, sure, sure. And then she would give him this little certificate saying that, you know, she could get coffee for free. I don't think they believed her, but she was very proud that uh, her son <laughs> was one of the owners of Dunkin' Donuts. Did she get her free coffee? She did. Every day she would go and get free coffee, and uh, Dunkin' Donuts has very good coffee. What are some other perks you were able to give your mom? Well, um, when she was getting older, she couldn't uh, get around as much. So I, you know, I charter planes for her to, to get to, to see her grandchildren or, or things like that. So, um, you know, I try to, um, you know, treat her as, as well as anybody could possibly treat their mother. But she didn't want a lot. She didn't want me to give her a lot of money. She didn't want fancy homes. She just was very modest in her upbringing, and and she didn't want to change her life that much. As your net worth grew, how did you maintain your humility? and not let it all get to your head? Well, you could argue I didn't maintain my humility <laughs> um, because I've given away a lot of money to lots of places, but sometimes they put my name on a building. So if you're really humble, you probably wouldn't put your name on a building. I put my name on buildings in part because I'm trying to say to people, you too can do this because I came from very modest circumstances. And if I rose up and can afford to put my name on a building at a university or someplace else, you too can do it. But I... I've tried to remain uh, humble because I think humility is one of the great virtues. I don't like arrogance. I think the greatest leaders in the world are humble. I've written a book on leadership, and one of the virtues that I think leaders have that are really good is humility. Now, every leader isn't humble. Uh, I don't imagine Napoleon was modest, and somebody who put named himself Alexander the Great probably wasn't modest. <laughs> but uh, you can't see Abraham Lincoln, who was very modest and humble, saying, you know, I won the Civil War by myself. I deserve all the credit. I'm the greatest man who ever lived. You can't see Abraham Lincoln saying that. He just wasn't do that. Now, we have had some leaders in our country who, let's say, are not modest, but they aren't the ones that I most admire. The ones I most admire are the ones who have some humility about them and who recognize there's a lot of luck going on in the world. And without luck, they might not have gotten where they are. And a lot of people help them get along the way, as a lot of people help me. So I think humility is one of the great virtues that really good leaders have. When you were first getting started in the industry, who were you looking up to as a leader that you aspired to be? Well, I always looked up to Warren Buffett because I thought while he was very smart and very wealthy, he lived in his original home in Omaha that he bought in 1957. He wasn't very flashy. He didn't tell people how great he was. And, but he really did hard work, and he didn't try to adopt a very fancy lifestyle. So I certainly admired him. And there are a lot of other people I admired. I admired Bill Gates for his commitment to philanthropy and, and to try to giving back to society. So I admire a lot of people who are wealthy but are giving back to society. And I think that's, in the end, the most important thing to do. The, heart, the most elusive thing in life, without doubt, is personal happiness. Uh, most people go through life and probably are not personally happy all the time. It's very difficult to be personally happy, but the best way to be personally happy, in my view, is to give to others, give to your children, give to society, help to make the world a better place. Those people that do that, I think, are personally more, more happy. Those people that basically just take their money and pile it up and just make a lot of, buy a lot of boats and planes and other things, I don't know that they're as happy. Some of the most tortured souls I've met are very wealthy people, and some of the happiest people I've met are people that have no money. So money doesn't equal happiness. It's other things that make you happy. And again, what is the point of life other than being happy? Mm -hmm. um, if you, the purpose of life is to make you sad, I, I think that's a, a strange way to look at life. I think life is designed to make people happy and to live a fulfilled life. And you do that through perhaps having children, perhaps uh, giving to others. And so I, I observe that all the time. And so when I want to say, okay, I want to be happy, I should help other people. That's, that's what motivates me. I read a study on happiness that the two things that money actually provides happiness for is one of the big things is buying time. So time is our right. resource that we can't get back. So if you can buy convenience and buy your time back with money, then that makes you happy. So if you can outsource cleaning your house, that would make you happy. And then the second one was the giving. So giving away your money does increase your happiness. Well, on time, uh, that's the most valuable commodity in the world. Uh, I tell people all the time, that, you know, philanthropists are uh, not looked at appropriately. When you list, look at the list of the biggest philanthropists in the world, you look at who's given away the most money. But you should look, away, look at who's given away the most of their time because time is more valuable. You can always make more money if you're inclined to do so. You can't make more time. 
And so I try to say to people that philanthropy is, a, is derived from an ancient Greek word that means loving humanity. And you can love humanity by giving your time, not your money necessarily. So uh, the woman that began uh, Teach for America, um, she did not have a lot of money, but she started that with her time or energy or ideas, and I think changed the face of, um, of education somewhat. So I always try to tell younger people, if you don't have money, fine, help other people with your time, and that can be just as fulfilling. On the note of time, are there any hard and fast rules you have around your time to be able to protect it so that you can use it towards giving? Well, I'm not as good at using my time the way I probably should in some respects. I'm not good at saying no. So if people ask me to make a speech, I tend to do so. If people ask me to do a podcast, I tend to do so. If people ask if I will interview them, I tend to do so. So I tend to be willing to accommodate other people's interests. So maybe I'm not the best uh, person in, in that respect, but I do think that I, I try to manage my time in a way that I'm uh, balancing it between family, uh, my business interests, my philanthropic interests, and then just my sanity by you know, having some time to think. Uh, you know, sometimes people uh, forget that you need time to actually think about things, or if you're writing a book, you have to have some time alone to actually write a book. It's, it takes a time to write a book, and you just can't do it by having people talk to you all the time and being in the middle of a buzzsaw of activity. What kind of information are you consuming now? Are you consuming social media? Are you reading a lot of books? How do you consume your information? I believe reading is one of the most important skills you can acquire. I, I love reading. I try to read about 100 books a year. There's typically books on something I know something about. I couldn't get through even one physics textbook. But if it's books on biography relating to business or it's books on um, politics or things like I know something about, then I can get through it. And I have a trick, which is I interview a lot of authors. So if you're interviewing authors, you should read the book. And so that kind of force feeds me to do it. But I, I, I'm probably not the best at reading social media. I don't, I'm not a, a, on any social media sites that I know of. Uh, and so I really am not uh, that au courant on social media. I should be better at it, <laughs> but I probably am too old to really adapt to it. My children are on it. And my children who went to places like Harvard and Stanford and Duke, they get their, their news sometimes from LinkedIn. So I go through the snowstorm to go buy a physical copy of the New York Times. I'm the only person actually showing up who still reads the New York Times in, in, in real paper. Um, everybody else reads it on, you know, on, on, the, on the computer or on the internet in some way. And people are getting a lot of their news from Facebook or LinkedIn or other social media sites. I'm still old fashioned in that way. But I think you can't read too much. And I, I try to tell people all the time, if you're really going to get ahead in the world, you've got to know what's going on. You've got to read. And I'm amazed at how many people graduate from college and they think they don't have to read anymore. Uh, sadly, about 30% of the people that graduate from college in this country never read another book in their life. And that's not good. About 50% of Americans haven't bought a book or been in a bookstore in the last five years. So it's not a great testament to our uh, desire to kind of make people really uh, educated and, and, and knowledgeable. Our country is a democracy. It's a representative democracy. The theory behind representative democracy is you have an informed citizenry. But if you don't have an informed citizenry, you're not going to have a good democracy. And obviously, we have a lot of people who are not completely informed about what's going on. What would you say are the three books that everyone should read this year? I think people should read something that they're interested in and, and try to read something that will um, make them feel better about themselves, make them feel they've learned something. There are an incredible number of really great books out there. And every week, there are great new books in the New York Times Book Review. They tell you all the great new books coming out. It doesn't make that much difference which book you read, but read some book. Well, I chair the National Book Festival, and I have for about 10 years. That's put on by the Library of Congress. And every year, we have about 150 of the best authors in the country come to Washington for one day. We get about 200,000 people coming, uh, and they get to meet the authors. The authors will sign their books for them or read from the books, and you have young children coming too, and getting young children to learn how to read is very important. So I try to encourage people to really do whatever they can to buy books, read books, take books from the library, because it was an important part of my own life, which is learning how to read. My parents couldn't afford to buy all the books that I might want to read, so I went to the library and I would take out 12 books uh, a week. You're allowed to take out 12 books at a certain age, and then I would read them in one day. And then I had to wait another week before I could take out 12 more books. But I, I think reading has uh, helped me a lot because I 
uh, I think I, it exposed me to the rest of the world that I wouldn't have been exposed to uh, just sitting in Baltimore. Besides reading, if you were to look back at the things that made you successful, what would you point to? Well, I think, uh, you know, it's hard to say humility because, you know, if you're telling people how wonderful you are, you can't be saying you're that humble. But humility is something I think is good. I think I, I learned in high school how to write reasonably well. Um, you know, I'm not Faulkner or Hemingway, but I know how to write reasonably well. And I think that's an important skill that I see increasingly people coming out of colleges and business schools. When I ask them to write a memo or something, they kind of, their grammar is sometimes not so wonderful, and they don't really know how to persuade people uh, by their writing well, and also by, uh, by learning how to talk publicly. Um, I did spend time, you know, I do spend a lot of time making speeches, and not because every speech I make is going to be the most important speech in the world, the most important audience, but it gives you practice in learning how to communicate. When you think about it, what is life all about? In the end, it's, down, it's about persuading other people to do what you want to some extent. That's what life's about, not the only thing. So how do you persuade your partner, your children, your business colleagues, any audience in the world to do what you want? Well, it takes three basic skills in my view. To be a, a person who persuades people, you should learn how to talk well. Uh, you don't have to be Martin Luther King, uh, but learning how to talk well can be very helpful in persuading people to do what you want. Uh, learning how to write well can also do it. You don't have to be, again, Hemingway or Faulkner or Abraham Lincoln in writing the Gettysburg Address, but learning how to write well can be helpful. And a third thing is, is learning how to do something that you want others to do by leading by example. When George Washington was at Valley Forge in 1777, he could have stayed at the Four Seasons of the Ritz-Carlton down the block. He said, no, I'm going to stay with my troops. I'm going to suffer with them. And by doing that, he really en engendered a lot of support from uh, his troops. So I think you have to lead by example, and that persuades people. And so I, I think I try to do things that will persuade other people to do what I want, learn how to talk well, learn how to write well, and maybe do certain things that will get other people to follow me. In your book, How to Invest, you interviewed over 20 of the greatest investors out there. What were the things that you saw that they all had in common? The great investors have a number of things in common. Number one, they tend to come from middle class or blue collar families, not from very wealthy families. They tend to have been very good in math. They tend to have been pretty good students overall, maybe better in math and other subjects. They also tend to be pretty well educated. Many have graduate degrees. They also tend to be people who are willing to um, go against the, the conventional wisdom. The conventional wisdom says, don't buy now or buy now, they will do the opposite. They also tend to be people who like to make the final decision. They don't want to delegate. Great investors don't say, well, you figure it out and let me know if it works out well. They tend to make the decision themselves. They also are pretty good at, uh, I would say, sharing the blame when something goes wrong. And when something goes wrong, they usually get out of it right away. They say, okay, I made a mistake. I'm going to get out of it, change my position. They also are pretty good at, uh, you know, I would say, sharing credit with other people. They're pretty good at as, as also, in, um, in my view, in uh, learning from their mistakes and figuring out how to make progress going forward. They tend to be fairly philanthropic. They also tend, when they make a lot of money, to not regard it as something they don't want to do anymore. They love investing because of the intellectual challenge of it and because it's, it's, to them it's a game of wits. And so when they've made a lot of money, why do they still do it? If you make $5 billion or $10 billion of net worth, why do you really need to keep doing it? Because they enjoy it. And that's one of the reasons why I think they're successful. You have to enjoy what you really do. As I've said earlier, um, Nobel Prize winners love what they do. They don't, they don't hate what they do. And if you're a great investor, you love it so much, the money is almost irrelevant. In the end, they tend to be fairly philanthropic, and the most, most, most of them are giving away all their money. So those are the things they tend to have in common. What about things that they don't have in common? Who of the people that you interviewed would you say is least like you, whether it's on views or the path that they've taken? Well, I would say they all have their idiosyncratic habits, and so they're different. Some people love to read physical newspapers or other materials in physical ways. Some like to do it online. Um, some people dress in a way that you know, may seem typical of a wealthy person, nice suit or tie or something if it's a man. Uh, but some of them, you know, like Jim Simons, a uh, very famous person who more or less invented quantitative investing, um, he never wears socks. So one time at a black tie dinner, I was interviewing him, and I looked down and no socks. And I kind of said to him, what happened? <laughs> um, 
And then he also has a habit of smoking two packs of cigarettes a day, which you know a lot of people uh, who tend to be pretty good investors tend to also be fairly healthy because they realize they've got a good thing going and they want to live long. Um, but he tends to be an a inveterate cigarette smoker, but you're not going to change him. He kind of brings his ashtray wherever he goes. Um, so they have different habits. They, uh, some of them tend to exercise a lot. Some of them don't exercise a lot. Uh, some of them tend to uh, have outside pleasures that are much different. Some are, are like sports. Some don't like sports. Some like uh, boating. Some don't like boating. So they have different kind of hobbies. And some of them uh, you know, are really good parents, and some of them are less focused on their children. So there are different uh, ways you look at these, these individuals. They're, they're different in some respects, for sure. How do you think these the people that you interviewed realized that they could have the potential to be good investors. Is that just over time you realize, okay, if I've been getting these returns, I'm a good investor? I think many of the investors, when they started, didn't think they were going to be investors. In fact, many of them came from backgrounds where they were doing something else and they kind of went into investing as a, as a second or third career choice. It wasn't something they were obsessed with when they were younger. I think that they um, made some mistakes early on. They learned from it. But after a number of years, if you're making successful investments, they generally figured out they're pretty good at it. So uh, generally, if, you, if you're making a lot of money in whatever investment area you're in, and people are telling you you're really good at something, eventually you probably figure out you are better than the average person. So if a 20-year-old were going to ask all of these great investors, how should I get started with investing? What's the best way to grow wealth through investing? What do you think everyone would answer? I think they would say... Um, Find a good place that somebody can mentor you. Uh, try to find something where you can be a specialist in something nobody else really is. Try to master your craft by really spending a lot of time learning it. You can't read too much about what you're doing. But also, uh, I would say, retaining some humility and learning how to get along with other people. Remember, there's nobody that is so brilliant that they can do everything by themselves. Everybody has to have partners in the investing world as well. And so learning how to get along with people is probably a pretty good idea, too. Mm -hmm. I know you look up to Warren Buffett. I also do. And Warren Buffett famously said that if he were to give advice, it would be to invest in low-cost S&P 500 index funds and then maybe some bonds as well. Is that what, would you agree with that? The average person uh, who is not going to be an investment professional probably should go into an index fund for his or her net worth. In other words... Warren Buffett's point is that uh, great hedge fund managers, in the end, will not beat the S&P and 500 index. Um, he's right in some respects, but some will beat. By definition, some will beat. And the best people and the people in this book are going to beat the market averages. Whether you know, you're smart enough to invest with them is another issue. But on the whole, what Warren Buffett is saying, and I agree with this, if you are a dentist or a doctor or a lawyer, you're pro probably going to spend a lot of time in your profession. You're not going to have time to look at stocks and do all the kind of detailed backgrounds checking on stocks or bonds. So have somebody else who's doing that full time as professional do it for you. Buy an index fund or things like that. If you want to be a professional investor, fine, but do it full time and learn how to really do it. And that's what Warren Buffett's point is. The average person is better off on an index fund. I think that's right. Now, of course, some people think that they're really smart and they're going to pick great funds, great stocks. But in the end, the person who's not doing that professionally full-time is probably going to lose money. It's like going to Las Vegas. If you go to Las Vegas because you enjoy gambling, uh, you might win in one night and think you're a genius. The next night, you're going to put it all back in, and you'll probably lose it all. And so in the investing world, if you have some luck early on as an average investor or an amateur investor, you might put it in more than you should the next time around and might lose it. When you say get somebody who does, it's quite hard to figure out who to trust. And I guess past performance is not indicative of future returns. So how do you find someone you trust? Or do you even well, need someone? Okay. When you're picking somebody to give your money to, look at their track record. See whether their track record is longstanding, what it is. Make sure the fees they're charging are appropriate. Make sure they'll give you information on a timely basis. Make sure they don't have a reputation for fraud, fraudulent behavior. Make sure the organization is stable. People aren't coming and going all the time. Make sure the younger people who are doing a lot of the legwork are adequately compensated so they're not going to pick up and leave. Make sure the people you're investing with are putting a lot of their own money alongside you. And also make certain that um, you feel comfortable in what they're doing with the money. So if somebody's making a lot of money and they, have, they meet all the other standards, but they're investing in, let's say, firearms, 
that might not be something you're comfortable with. So make sure it's an industry that you're comfortable with, with what they're doing, and also make certain that whatever their track record has been, that it's not an area that's going away. So if you were an ex expert in investing in buggy whips and automobiles are coming along, a buggy whip investment company might not be that great. So you want to make sure that the, the, all these standards are met. And if you meet these standards, you probably will do reasonably well in investing. How should someone who is 20 and starting out investing versus 30 versus 40 versus 50 be thinking about it differently? I think people in their 20s probably shouldn't be worried about their retirement that much. Try to learn uh, what the investment world's about and learn about money. Uh, we don't really teach financial literacy very much in junior high school and high school. So you might graduate or, from high school or college and really not know anything about investing or how to manage your money. And it's an important part of uh, one's life. And so I would say people should take the time to learn more about financial literacy. If you're in your 20s, that's a time you can experiment. You don't have to worry about your retirement then. And you can take some bolder risks at your 20s. Um, you get to be in your 30s, you have maybe family responsibilities, you have children and so forth. You have to be more risk adverse because you can't afford probably to lose as much as you might when you're in your 20s, you're single and you're just investing for your own account. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of allocations, like if people want to know what percent should go towards index funds? What would you say is well? It depends the starting to point. some extent on one's net worth, what their earning potential is. If let's suppose you're a, a second grade teacher, you're probably not going to earn that much. So you probably should be very, fairly risk adverse. Fixed income kinds of investments or very safe um, index stock funds, things that are not likely to go um, under or go bankrupt. If you are um, a person who works at a hedge fund and you're probably going to make a fair amount of money doing that, and you're probably willing to experiment, you know, then you can do some more exotic things in the, in the alternative investment world if you're willing to take a big risk. It depends on how much money you already have and, and how much money you are likely to make in the future. But remember, the most important rule about investing is don't lose what you have. Don't put all your eggs in the basket and actually read what you're, you're, you're putting your money into. Make sure you know as much about what you're putting your money into as your profession. If you're a dentist or a doctor, you presumably know what you're doing. Well, if you're investing, you just can't uh, say, well, I'll give it to Joe to look at, or I'm not going to really pay much attention to what I'm putting my money into. Put in the same time and attention to your investing as you do to your profession. But what about someone who says, well, I only have, I'm working all of these hours. I only have two hours a month to possibly put well, towards investing. Well, if that's your situation, then you probably should invest in an index fund. A, a Vanguard, T. Rowe Price, Fidelity, BlackRock index fund that will track the market. So you won't you know, lose all your money. You're not going to get rich doing it. But, but you basically will do how the market does. And the markets generally do pretty well. Uh, over um, 100 years or so, the stock market averages in the United States roughly a 6% rate of return. So while that's not great, it's enough to make sure you're, you're, you're probably going to do better than if you just put it in a bank account and got a very small amount, or you just put it under your mattress. Again, the most important thing is don't lose what you have if you're very you know, concerned about your financial future. If you, are, you have an MBA from a great business school, you're going to go work at a great venture firm, and they have enormous amounts of assets. They're going to teach you how to do it. You can probably be a little more uh, willing to take risks because in the end, you're probably in the business of making money. But if you're, a, again, a, a second grade teacher, you're not going to get wealthy doing that, so you should be more risk adverse. I know you were talking earlier about how financial literacy is one of the big issues in the school systems. Why aren't they teaching us about personal finance? If you were to create a curriculum for high school students to take on personal finance, what would you talk about? What would be in it? Well, I try to explain what, what investing is all about. Many people don't really understand the rules of investment, how it works. Also, people don't understand rates of return, how you measure them, why they're relevant. People also don't understand the risks and rewards of certain types of investments. The traditional investments, stocks and bonds, are maybe modestly known by people, but so-called alternative investments, private equity, buyouts, venture capital, distressed debt, opportunistic real estate, are not known by most people outside the investment world. And so that's something you could learn about as well. And then also you should recognize that for a lot of people, the most important investment they're going to make is in their house. And so make sure you understand what it means to buy a house, how to mortgage a house if you're using a mortgage, and how you, know, you can borrow against that if you need to at some times. But generally, learning more about money is something that I think would be helpful. Uh, I went to a large public high school in Baltimore. There was never any discussion of financial literacy then. And in college, I majored in political science, 
And I could have taken some courses, I guess, in finance, but they didn't really have it at Duke at the time that I know of. And so I don't, I don't think it was available then. But today, if you go to a business school undergraduate, you're going to learn about this. But the average person is not going to Wharton undergraduate. The average person is, is going to a, a school that doesn't probably teach financial literacy that much. You were mentioning the house as being most people's big, biggest investment. What are the biggest mistakes people make when it comes to buying their house? The biggest mistakes people make, I think, are thinking that when they buy a house, it's, a, it, it's something that should appreciate in value dramatically. It probably may not. When you buy a house, you should do it because you're happy with the house. You're going to live there. It might appreciate over a period of time, but it shouldn't be um, something you make you buy just to make it as an investment. It is you're typically the biggest asset that people have and their biggest investment. But I always tell people, buy a house you're happy to live in, you're happy to entertain guests there, uh, not because you think you're going to make a lot of money on it. Secondly, don't borrow more money than you can afford to, to service. You know, most people buy homes with uh, mortgages, which is a, another word for a loan, and make sure you can afford to pay off the loan. Some people can't afford to pay off the loan. They lose the house. They should recognize that mortgages have their downsides to them. And you should also recognize that there are some financial benefits that you can get by borrowing money as well, tax benefits and so forth. But make sure you get somebody to tell you what you're doing. Don't just buy a house without have somebody in, in telling you about the financial benefits and, and challenges of owning a house with a mortgage. When your kids were growing up, what were you trying to teach them about money? My children growing up, I, I can't say that I did a wonderful job uh, teaching them about money. Uh, because I didn't really want them to be obsessed over it that much. Um, obviously, I was financially very secure, but I didn't say to them, you need to go to business school and you need to go into private equity. As it turns out, all of them went to business school and all of them went into private equity. And so maybe something rubbed off. But I think it's important for parents to teach children something about money, not to make them nervous about it, because you don't want to make your, your children completely nervous that you're, you're going to have financial problems and their future is not going to be secure. So I didn't talk that much to my children about how my deals were doing, how Carlisle was going, because I wanted to have other relationships with them. But I don't think it's a bad idea to explain certain things to your children about money once they're old enough to understand it. I know a lot of people share this experience with me where my parents, I, I think to grow wealth, you either have to save more money or earn more money. And a lot of people are good at the saving more money. So my parents were very good at teaching me how to be frugal growing up, how to make sure every dollar was stretched as much as possible. But my parents didn't really know the other side of the equation, which is how to make your money work for you, how to invest. And so I feel like a lot of people experience this where they, they at 18, when they leave the house, they're very good at saving. They're not good at making and learning how to make their money, make more money. So as a parent, by the time you had your kids, you were already quite successful at the making money part and investing part. Were there any specific things that you were teaching your children about investing? Well, I didn't teach my children about investing. I would talk about what I was doing and they would read about it from time to time. But I didn't want to put pressure on my children to do what I had done uh, because I had been uh, successful, as it turned out, in private equity. But I didn't want them to think that they had to be in private equity to make me happy. It turned out they all went into private equity um, and I'm happy they're in it, but I didn't obsess over their doing that. I think they all thought they would do something different. My son went to law school, but then he decided while there he wanted to go to business school as well, and so he, he did that. My uh, oldest daughter uh, wanted to go to medical school, and then eventually after doing a couple pre-med classes, she concluded that might not be so wonderful. And my other daughter uh, was interested in um, healthy and food, and healthy food, and she didn't really realize that would be a... Uh, investment category at some point, but she ultimately made that an investment category. So none of them uh, grew up thinking they would probably do what I did. It just turned out that way. Back to the investing topic. So I know we've talked about if you're a 20 year old and don't really have time to invest, probably the safest route is just a low cost S&P 500 index fund. What about the overambitious person who says, I want to beat the market? What's the best path for them? Well, if somebody wants to be a professional investor or really wants to take bigger risks, obviously there are things you can do. I would recommend still reading and knowing what you're doing. But I would say you can invest alongside or with the best venture capitalists in their funds, the best buyout people in their funds, uh, the best uh, growth capital people in their funds. Invest with people that have a pretty good track record. Um, that can be something you can learn from. It just depends, again, how much money you have and how much risk you're going to, you're going to take. 
Um, again, I think the most important thing is try not to lose what you have and don't put all your eggs in one basket and read, read, read about what your money manager is doing so you really are informed. I know with Carlisle, you started in 1986, 1987, and then you started to find a lot of success with that. I've heard that once you reach a certain point in your net worth, your strategy for money goes from growth to preservation. So you're thinking about how to preserve the money you've made. When did that switch happen for you and how are you thinking about your wealth? Well, if you're in the investment world and you've done well in it, you don't generally all of a sudden say, you know what, I don't want to do it again. I if you think you can make a lot of money in buyouts, you've made a lot of money in buyouts or venture capital, you probably will keep doing it if you're a professional. Well, famous investment banker Felix Rowden once said, when asked, what is it, at what point in life are you financially secure? How much money does it take? And his answer was, and I think he was right, about twice whatever you have. So in other words, you're never financially secure. Nobody feels financially secure. If you talk to people that are worth $10 billion and say, well, geez, I was worth $15 billion a week ago. Now I'm only worth $10 billion. I don't feel good. So you're never going to be completely financially secure, I suspect, unless you're Bill Gates or somebody like that. But generally, I would say if you, if you know what you're doing in the investment world, um, you probably are going to keep doing it for a while. You're not all of a sudden going to get to the preservation stage if you're you know, if you've made a lot of money and you think you can keep doing it. Now, let's suppose you get to the age of 80 and you say, I don't need to make any more money. I've got, I've made billions of dollars. Well, you know, maybe they're in wealth preservation at that point, but is it because they're giving away money and they want to make sure they've got it to give away? But generally, the investment professionals have a high degree of confidence in their ability and they tend not to just go from doing venture capital to uh, fixed income. Besides philanthropy, which we'll get into, what is the greatest thing that you can buy with money? Well, the theory has always been that if you have more money, you can buy personal happiness. I don't really think that's necessarily true because I've indicated before some of the wealthiest people are, are tortured souls. But I would say that with money, you probably can buy privacy to some extent if you want it. You can probably buy um, time saving things. So for example, if you're a wealthy person, you might be able to have a private jet. So you don't have to go to the airport, go through the check-in lines, wait for the plane to be canceled, do a connection and so forth. That saves a lot of time. Uh, with money, you can probably help other people more than uh, if you don't have money, you can help them with some philanthropy or gifts or so forth. I'd say as a general rule of thumb, people um, think that having money probably is an advantage to themselves. When they get it, sometimes they're not as happy as they thought they would be. But, and again, when you have a certain amount of money, you always want more. So it doesn't necessarily mean you're happy if you have a billion dollars, you think you should have two billion. If you have two billion, you think you should have five billion. If you have five billion, you think you should have 10 billion. So it's a never ending kind of circle. Do you think there's ever going to be a point where you decide, I'm going to retire now and go to a beach house, please don't bother me? There are many people that, look, my, my father, as I said, worked in the post office. He was legally able to get the maximum, or pretty much the maximum retirement benefit when he was retiring at 55. So he retired at 55. Um, you know, I couldn't conceive of retiring that young. Um, and I also worry that retirement is a concept that might work for some people, but I also fear that when you retire, I have this theory, which no doctor will subscribe to, that the immune system will sit inside your body and say, oh, oh, he's retired. I don't need to be prepared for anything so we can relax. And all of a sudden the immune system relaxes and some bad disease comes in and attacks a, a sleeping immune system. So I don't want my immune system to think it can relax. So I'm keep going so that the immune system won't relax. You do see people retire, and I'm not exaggerating, they drop dead on a golf course a, a year later or less. A lot of people I know who have retired have gotten very ill in their first or second year of retirement. So maybe my immune system theory is, is at work. So I, I'm not gonna retire, um, they'll have to you know, carry me out. What are you very excited about still accomplishing? Well, I would like to, uh, help the, the nonprofits that I'm in the board chair of and help get those things in better shape. Um, I would like to um, continue to help educate people about civics and history in this country. I do a lot of what it's called patriotic philanthropy. I still have a lot of historic documents I want to preserve and historic buildings I want to preserve. Um, I have given a fair amount of money to various medical causes. I created the Pancreatic Cancer Center at Sloan Kettering. That's a disease that I think would be good if we can help eradicate it, but it's not easy. And I'm involved with some other um, diseases that I, I would like to see more progress on. But, you know, in the end, you know, I, 
you, you try to do as much as you can, but you, you can't solve every problem and you can't do everything that people want you to do. I saw that you're also helping pandas. Yes. Um, pandas, um, I was the chairman of the Smithsonian and the Smithsonian owns the National Zoo. And one time the head of the National Zoo came in and said, we, we, we are, might lose our pandas because we actually rent pandas from the Chinese. The Chinese rent pandas to 27 zoos around the world for roughly a million dollars a year, more or less. And the sponsor of this at the National Zoo had decided they weren't going to do it anymore. So they thought we might lose the panda. So I said, well, I'll put up the money for it. And that was about 10 years ago now, and I've been supporting it. Pandas are a very unique animal because they're only about maybe 2,000 on the face of the earth. They're seven, no, there's 8 billion people on the face of the earth, but only 2,000 pandas. And that's because the panda's reproductive system doesn't work so well. It's very unique, very difficult for them to reproduce. And so, uh, you know, I won't say they're endangered any longer, but uh, the pandas need some help. I learned from hearing some interviews you've done about the panda reproductive system yes. I knew nothing about. Well, the panda, the female panda goes into estrus and can reproduce roughly, uh, let's say, one day a year, more or less. So in that one day a year, if the male panda doesn't show up, there's not going to be any more baby pandas. And then when the male panda shows up, he's inexperienced. He only does this once a year. <laughs> so he doesn't know what to do, and the female doesn't know what to do, and so they fumble a lot, but they only have a limited period of time. So if they fumble too much, it's, the time passes. So in captivity, they have to artificially inseminate the female if the male hasn't figured out what to do in a, in a couple hours or so. That's so interesting. Who would have known? What do you think is the best way that you can use your money now to have an outsized impact on future generations? There's a limit to how much money I have and how much I can do. So I don't have enough money to solve climate change. That's something, I, it's too big and too comprehensive and probably I won't live long, long enough to see it. So when I try to look at philanthropic things, I have four rules. I wanna start something that otherwise wouldn't get started. I wanna finish something that otherwise wouldn't get finished. I want to have an intellectual interest, so I'll stay involved, go on the board, and, and do more than just write a check. And fourth, I want to see progress in my lifetime. So I'm 73, so my lifetime isn't going to be another 30 years or so. So I'm trying to find projects that I think will be meaningful, but you know can be accomplished. So climate change is a wonderful uh, endeavor and cause, but I don't know that I have enough money or time or resources to be able to solve it. So I tend to find things that are more simpler or where other people aren't doing it. Switching gears a little, if you were to look back at your career, what is one thing that you wish you would have done differently? Well, I wish I had probably gone to business school because I didn't understand business as much as I should. So I, and my son got a JD MBA from Stanford. And when I was in law school, MBAs weren't considered quite as valuable as maybe they are today. So I never considered it. Also, I needed to graduate pretty quickly to just you know, to kind of get the workforce and start making some money. So I didn't, I wish I'd had an MBA. I wish I had started my firm earlier. I, after I left the White House, I spent five years practicing law and no good came from it. I didn't really help my clients very much. I didn't really enjoy it. So I, I wish I had started Carlisle earlier. I wish I had not made some mistakes at Carlisle on certain things and I could have built an even better firm. Um, you know, those are some of the things I wish. And of course, everybody who's a parent will say, I wish I had spent more time with my children when they were younger. Now, my children turned out reasonably well because they, what more can you want if your children are in the private equity world and in the highest calling of mankind, as I've said, and they're all doing reasonably well. But, you know, again, you can always spend more time with your children. Why do you consider it the highest calling of mankind? When I say that, well, it's obviously tongue in cheek. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, there are very few people you can, or professions or things you can make fun of today. You can still make fun of members of Congress. You know, you can make fun of members of Congress and people won't sue you. You can make fun of lawyers because people always do. Yep, and I you can those. make fun of private equity because private equity has not a wonderful image in some ways. So if you can make fun of it. So I tongue in cheek always say it's the highest calling of mankind, which obviously it's not. Um, but, you know, it's something people laugh at. So does anything hurt you when people say certain things about you? Does it impact you? About I don't know. Like, for, for instance, I'm on social media a lot. So yes. I'll hear a lot of negative things about myself. You know, oh, people okay. aren't happy with my smile or they're not happy that I'm yes. saying this about finance. Okay. What impacts you? Um, well, first, I don't read any social media, so I don't have the obsess over all the criticisms I get. Uh, I get plenty of criticisms from letters, people giving me uh, things saying I should give money to this or I should have 
done something differently or Carlisle did something in the investment world they shouldn't have done. You know, you, at, at some point in life, you have to recognize people are always going to criticize something and you have to get used to it. So I, I, I don't obsess over that much and I don't, uh, I'm not worried about social media. The best way not to worry about it is, um, is to not follow it. Now, maybe I don't follow it because when my daughter was a student at Harvard, uh, she met a young man she's mar now, now married to. He had been a classmate at Phillips Exeter and at Harvard of Mark Zuckerberg. And so he told me that Mark Zuckerberg was trying to raise money and uh, would I like to invest? And I said, well, this is really a dating service and I don't think dating services really get anywhere. So no, I'm not going to do that. Now, somebody else who put in $30,000 at that time, uh, that 30000 became worth $15 billion at one point. So I maybe because I... Um, I'm so upset that I didn't put the money in that I don't use social media. I don't know. <laughs> I also saw that you passed up on investing in Amazon. Yes. Um, I told uh, Jeff Bezos this was not going to work. He never beat Barnes & Noble. Uh, we helped him at the beginning with some bibliography that he needed on books and print. And he, and he gave us some stock, but we sold it right away because we thought it wasn't going anywhere. How much would that stock be worth now? Uh, probably about uh, $15 billion. Oh, my goodness. And what about his plan did you not think was going to work? His, Why did you think that he wouldn't be able to be? Well, remember, at, at the Nobles? time that uh, I knew, I went to see Jeff when he was starting. He was at, you know, 15 employees or something. He was in a ramshackle office building. He was only going to sell books over the Internet. There was no plan to sell everything. So if he only sold books over the internet, he wouldn't be that famous or wealthy today. It's when he expanded beyond selling books over the internet that he became extremely wealthy and successful because of all the good things he did in building a company. But selling books are not going to be that profitable, I thought. And I just didn't think he could take on Barnes & Noble. But I was wrong. And I saw Jeff the other night. And, and uh, you, know, I, you know, I told him I was wrong. He knows I was wrong. I've interviewed <laughs> him many times. But... Uh, you know, anyway, he had the last laugh. He built a great company. What do you talk about when you get together with Jeff Bezos off camera, just sitting at dinner? What do you talk about with him? Well, it was a, we, we, we were at an event recently with the National Portrait Gallery, and um, he was a, a sponsor of uh, a dinner that we had at his house in Washington. And so we talked about, uh, you know, what he's doing now and his children and, you know, his house and so forth. But, uh, you know, I've known him for a while. And, you know, I don't say, Jeff, uh, you know, you're great. I mean, can you give me a billion dollars for a charitable cause that I have in mind? I, you know, don't do that. <laughs> what do you think of Elon Musk? I've interviewed him. Um, I interviewed him a couple months ago in Aspen for about an hour. He's a brilliant person, obviously a very good engineer. Uh, whether anybody can run three major companies at once, I don't know. Um, you know, it's very daunting to even run two at once. But, you know, when you become the richest man in the world, you must be pretty smart and pretty talented at something or another. And I think he is pretty smart and pretty talented. Yeah, for sure. Who's your friend group? I know you interview a lot of these great investors and these very successful people. Who do you hang out with on the weekends? Well, um, who do I hang out with on weekends? Uh, I generally don't hang out so much. I usually am making a speech. I'm going to an event. So, I don't have that much built-in time, um, but I, you know, I have some friends I've known for a long time, and I have people that I work with that I also spend time with. And then I have my children. Now I have two little grandchildren, and um, you know, we'll see how they do. I have um, a, you know, about a five-year-old granddaughter and a uh, about three-year-old grandson. And when I was the co-chair of the Harvard Capital Campaign. I was asked to make a speech at the end of the capital campaign, and I got up and said, look, I didn't actually go to Harvard, but I was the co-chair of the campaign, happy to do so, happy to contribute. But if anybody can help my then two-year-old granddaughter get into Harvard, early, early, early decision, let me know. <laughs> and the next day, I got a certificate admitting her into Harvard as a joke, but uh, <laughs> um, she was admitted uh, 20 years early. But, um, you, know, I, I, you know, I have a fair number of friends, but, you know, when you get more successful in life, uh, you have probably often, you have more acquaintances, but how many true friends can you have? People that you can really let your hair down with and, and not worry at some point they're going to ask you for money for this or this or that. So, um, but I'm, I'm happy. I have enough friends and can't keep them, you know, I can't 
spend as much time with each of them as I like, but I still spend time with friends from high school and friends from uh, the rest of, the, of my life. It sounds like as you've grown your net worth, one of the things that you do have to be cautious about is this defensive mechanism because people want more and more right. from you. Yes. What else has changed about you over the years as your net worth has grown? Well, uh, I do get asked for a lot of uh, philanthropic requests and not just time requests. Um, and I try to, you know, assess them. But I generally know what I want to do. So I'm, generally people don't come with ideas over the transom that I'm that interested in, but sometimes I've done that. Most of my money has been things that I came up with the idea and kind of to do, but not all of them. And, uh, you know, sometimes people ask you for money or friends, and they're probably reluctant to do so, but they kind of were told that it might be a good idea. And sometimes if it's reasonable, you'll do it, and if it's not reasonable. Um, sometimes, for example, I hadn't seen somebody since high school, you know, 50, 60 years ago, and uh, one day he called me and said, hey, I've heard you've done well. Look, uh, I have a cause here. I'd like you to contribute fifty million dollars to. I hadn't talked to him in fifty years, <laughs> and he asked for fifty million dollars for that particular cause. I thought was a bit of a stretch. Oh my goodness! So then, but how do you respond, or do you pretend you didn't say, see it? Say, I'll take a look at it. But, or, or some case, in that case, <laughs> I probably said probably not an area of great interest. But you know, I get re requests every day for money. It probably fifty million dollars of requests a week. And, you know, I try to be polite to everybody and write a letter back explaining why I can't do this. Uh, and sometimes, amazingly, people call me and say, I never, get, I never expect to get a letter back. Usually I send in these requests. I never hear from people. At least you're polite enough to send me a letter. But uh, <laughs> try to be polite. One of the things I really care about is impact. I, I don't think I'll ever reach the level of success that you have, but I really want in my lifetime to have You're a lot already of more successful. How many followers do you have? <laughs> 17 million. Yeah, see, well, <laughs> I, I, I think... Uh, and one of the reasons I'm not on social media is that I don't want to read that I have six followers. So, you know, Kim Kardashian has, I don't know, 8 billion followers, and uh, Kanye West has 12 billion followers. I'm afraid somebody will say, well, Rubenstein is on Twitter and he has seven followers. So that's why I don't do it. But you have 17 million. That's staggering. So that's pretty If successful. you want to come on social media, I can help you. I can tell people to follow I, you. I don't know. I, I've interviewed the CEO of TikTok. He said he could make me a TikTok star, but so far I'm not a TikTok star. Have you taken him up on it? I haven't done anything to become a TikTok star. Oh. But maybe I should. Uh, you have to try. You have to put a little effort in. What do you want to be known as? Do you want to be known as the founder of well, Carlisle? Uh, somebody that uh, you know tried to give back to the country in some ways and had some impact. So I suspect if I died tomorrow, the obituary will say, you know, Carlisle co-founder, patriotic philanthropist, and savior of the pandas. What is something that people don't know about you? Well, that I'm extremely handsome when I and, and charming and debonair, and I could have been a movie star like George Clooney, but I just decided not to do that. <laughs> they, they didn't know that. People don't know that. Um, actually, at the Kennedy Center Honors in a couple of weeks, George Clooney will be there, and I'll get to meet him for the first time. I don't really know him, but he'll be oh, there. We're gonna, you'll have gonna, to tell him. And we also are honoring Bono, so I'll get to meet him too. Oh, that's cool. It'll be nice, right? Have you ever been disappointed meeting one of these famous people? Frequently. Oh. Well, I mean, <laughs> you know, you, you read about people for 10, 15, 20 years, and then you meet them and you say, wow, how did this person get where they got? But sometimes they're better than you expect. And actually, they tend to be fairly friendly um, and very polite and so forth. But sometimes you meet famous people and you say, how did they get there? I won't give any names. Yeah. What disappoints you? Is it mostly arrogance? Sometimes arrogance. I'm not a big fan of arrogance. So sometimes people are very arrogant and what I don't like is when they're screaming at their assistants and yelling at this and that. I tend to like pop like that. Well, you can become president of the United States and not be humble. Um, it, you, you can get very far not being humble, but generally not in the quality that I admire as much. Being, I think arrogance is not good. So the podcast is called Erica Taught Me, but really today is all about David Rubenstein Taught Me. So what do you want people to walk away from this interview being able to say, David taught me this? that they should use their potential to try to do something meaningful with their life, try to find something where they can say, this is what I did with my life, so that 10 years from now, 15 years from now, 20 years from now, they could say to their children, this is what I did. Uh, hopefully you'll be proud of it. They could say to their parents, this is what I did. Thank you for helping to create me. And so I think you should try to find something meaningful in life. It doesn't have to be solving peace in the Middle East, but something where you've contributed to society 
in a way that made the world a slightly better place than when you came into the world. Thank you so much. Thank you. If you enjoyed today's conversation with David, check out his latest book, How to Invest, Masters on the Craft. I'll put the link in the show notes. And if you haven't yet, please take a moment to review the podcast wherever you're listening to it now. It really helps support the work that we're doing. Thank you for spending your time with me today, and I'll talk to you next Tuesday on a brand new episode of Erica Taught Me.